lecture in about 30 seconds. So the recording is progress and I will start the introduction uh, shortly. Okay, well, um, thank you everyone for joining us online. My name is Timothy Brick. I'm assistant professor at Kyiv School of Economics. Um, this is a 14th day of the Russian invasion to Ukraine and uh, you know, the whole world is watching. Um, we have to say that this war has not been uh, only against you know, our nation and our army civilians has been attacked, uh, children has been attacked, have been attacked. And unfortunately, we also see that uh, our science and knowledge uh, have been attacked as well. Our universities are bombed, faculties are bombed. A lot of our colleagues, uh, professors, postdocs, uh, PhD and master's students are refugees now. Um, that is why our university, Kyiv School of Economics, has initiated a new series of lectures called Global Minds for Ukraine. We invite top uh, intellectuals, influential um, scholars, diplomats to talk with us, uh, to give their public lectures, to support Ukraine and to show their solidarity. Uh, right now we are broadcasting from, from Ukraine. I'm in Kyiv myself. We have uh, received some alarms about the um, airstrikes in, in the city and the suburbs. So that's why I'm broadcasting from my shower, which is my semi-shelter. Uh, I strongly advise, you know, if you're in Kiev or in any other endangered place, you should proceed to your uh, real shelters, basements, subways. Please be careful. You can always watch this lecture later. We will post it on YouTube. Um, we have hosted some great speakers already. We will host more speakers. I just posted um, the whole list of our guests uh, in the chat. But today, specifically, we have a very special guest, uh, Professor Nicholas Christakis. Um, he's a very famous um, sociologist who has studied uh, social network analysis and um, and in general, you know, the, <laughs> the humanity itself. Um, he has a very broad portfolio, but I want to say a few words, uh, more, you know, more personal words from, from myself. I teach social network analysis at Kiev School of Economics. Um, and every time when I talk with my students during my first lecture, I always show them several videos. And these are the videos of Nicholas Christakis talking on TED Talk or uh, Big Think YouTube channel uh, where he presents what social network analysis is and how can it help us to understand the nature of humanity, happiness, uh, um, social norms, and influence. That is why I'm very happy to see Nicholas Christakis with us today. And I hope that our students who were robbed from this opportunity to listen to to, to a series of our lectures, at least they can be, you know, they can get some satisfaction by, by having uh, Nicholas today with us. So thank you very much. This virtual floor is yours, uh, Professor Christakis, and uh, we, will, um, we will have a Q&A session after, after the end of your lecture. Thank you. Uh, Timothy, thank you so much for that introduction and, um, and the very kind words. Are, you, are we already recording? We are. All right. And uh, thank you to the students who are here. And it's quite an extraordinary experience that we are having together. And I, I um, you know, my, my, grand, my father survived the Nazi occupation of Athens. He was a little boy. He's in his 80s now. And I used to talk to my grandfather about his experiences under occupation. And um, I never thought I would see this live to see the same kind of thing happening in Europe, at least in my lifetime. And I, I hope very much that there's a speedy resolution to this war um, in the dire direction of the 
that you are you the Ukrainians are aspiring to. Um, so I um, I would like to talk to you a little bit about it might seem a bit paradoxical, but I think it's relevant also to the predicament that we find ourselves in. Uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the evolutionary origins of a good society. And uh, this is based on a book of mine called Blueprint, which is slated to come out in Ukrainian. Actually, it was supposed to be translated in Ukrainian and released this year, although obviously that's going to be delayed. And part of the motivation for this is that for too long, in my view, the scientific community has been focused on the dark side of, uh, of our evolutionary heritage on our capacity for selfishness and lying and tribalism and cruelty and violence. And of course, you in Ukraine are seeing that in a very real way right now. But I also think that the bright side of human nature has been denied the attention it deserves because our species has also evolved to be good and to manifest wonderful qualities like love and friendship and cooperation and teaching. And these good qualities must have outweighed the bad qualities or we wouldn't live socially in the first place. If, if every time I lived with you or I came near you, you were violent to me or you lied to me or you stole from me, I would be, or you killed me, I would be better off living apart from you. So the benefits of a connected life must have outweighed the costs evolutionarily speaking. Otherwise, we'd live in a solitary fashion like many other animals. So our species has evolved a particular kind of, uh, of such a good society. And these good qualities are also very relevant to how we resist evil. Now, uh, Timothy, is the next slide uh, on the screen now? Yes, innate sociality. Yeah, great. Thank you. I'll continue then. Um, we've evolved, in fact, to live in a very particular social way, equipped with a very particular set of innate capacities. And we are not simply like a group of zebras or crocodiles or ants massing together. And in fact, modern science has a lot to say about how our groups function optimally. Now, we manifest this social ability very early in life. And many have argued, for instance, that one of the primary functions of play in childhood is simply to prepare us for living socially. Well, what kind of evidence can we use to understand the kind of social order that comes naturally to us and that we are universally predisposed to make? If you were a mad scientist and you wanted to figure out what kind of society would humans naturally make? What would you would most like to do is to take a group of babies and uh, abandon them on some distant island and somehow magically have them grow up and then come back sometime later and see not just what kind of adults did they grow up to be, but what kind of society did they wind up forming? That would be the kind of experiment you would love to do if you were a mad scientist. But obviously, we can't do such an experiment. It's cruel and unethical, and it's been called the forbidden experiment. But such an experiment has actually been contemplated or attempted by various rulers who have typically been interested in what sort of language comes naturally to us. According to Herodotus, for example, the Egyptian pharaoh Psamtik I had some children raised without being spoken to uh, in order to see what language they would uh, speak when they grew up. In other words, these monarchs, they said, if, if, the, if the babies weren't taught to speak, what would they speak on their own naturally? So all of these rulers contrived to have some babies raised by mute shepherds up in the mountains, for example, where they were never spoken to. And then the idea was to come back and see, well, what language did they speak naturally? Now, of course, we can't do that. But it's worth asking what might be some proxy experiments. And there are a number of possibilities with respect to such natural experiments. For example, consider the idea of shipwrecks, where people are thrown together without intending it and are left to somehow make society anew. How do people 
including, for example, displaced people like refugees, how, when they are thrown together, how do they work to form some kind of social order? Well, shipwrecks is such an example. And out of over 9,000 shipwrecks that occurred between 1500 and 1900, I was able to identify 20 where the castaways numbered about 19 people who were um, isolated for two months or more. And those, that sample of um, 20 shipwrecks is shown here over a four century period. These communities were born in violence. And I studied in detail what kind of social order they made for themselves. One particularly powerful pair of cases involved two crews who were stranded on opposite ends of this island, the Auckland Islands, which are south of New Zealand and just north of Antarctica uh, in, the, in the year 1864, completely independently, two different shipwrecks occurred uh, on, in the same year on this island. One crew wrecked on the southern part of the island and one crew wrecked on the northern part of the island. On the southern part, the ship Grafton crashed and five men made it ashore uh, and all of them survived. On, on the northern part of the island, the Inverco crashed and 19 men made it ashore uh, and all but three of them died. What was the difference in the fate of these two shipwrecks? Well, there was a lot that explained the differential success of those two groups. Uh, one of the things that was fascinating to me was how the wrecks began. So on the Grafton, on the southern part of the island, when the ship crashed, the captain was in his cabin with a fever and four of the men made it ashore and they had to decide what to do about the captain who was uh, gonna go down with the ship. And they decided to set up a rope relay and to ferry and to save the captain's life and to ferry him ashore at great risk to their own lives. So the beginning of the Grafton wreck began with a group working together and saving a life. On the Inverco, they wrecked at the bottom of a large cliffs and one of the men when they landed, the 19 men landed, was injured. And they stayed for a number of days at the bottom of this cliff, but then finally 18 of the men climbed up the cliff and abandoned that other man to die. And eventually, almost all of those people died. So the Inverco began with a sacrifice of a life, the opposite kind of beginning. And those two crews, in my judgment, had very different fates, partly as a result. Now, of course, it's not, being, it's not pleasant to be part of these experiments, uh, but nevertheless, the, uh, the crew of the Grafton was able to make a dwelling and work together and survive for two years before they were able to build a boat and uh, sail, sa sa sail off in order to get some help. And in my work, I also looked not only at unintentional communities like shipwrecks, but also intentional communities like groups of people that go out to establish an independent commune, for example, like the 19th century communes in the United States, where people deliberately set out to remake society, possibly in a new way. People have been doing this at least since Roman times. For thousands of years, we have records of people saying, society is messed up. Let's have a group of people go off and try to make society in its own way. And of course, I looked at 20th century communes too, and kibbutzes in Israel, and isolated outposts of scientists in Antarctica, groups of scientists every year, about 30 of them or so, uh, spend 10 months isolated on the South Pole, totally separated from the rest of the planet. And in online worlds and all kinds of uh, social ways of living socially online, and at, many, and, at, and at many other examples I looked at, like nuclear submarine crews, or Latin American prisons, or groups of miners stranded deep beneath the earth, and communities formed by displaced persons in the wake of natural disasters or war. And finally, in my laboratory, we've done many experiments using software we've developed where we create temporary artificial societies of real people. About 30,000 people have come to play our experiments in my laboratory uh, using these online tools. And we experimentally manipulate the order, the organization of those people and ask questions about how that social order 
affects the ability of those people to work together. And this has allowed us to probe the deep underpinnings of social order. And what I found is that there were some deep and fundamental principles that constrain us to only one way of being social. Now, let me illustrate this by reference to a very famous example from zoology known as the world of all possible shells, like seashells, like on the seashore. And in the 1960s, uh, a paleontologist by the name of David Raup became fascinated by shell morphology, the shape of shells, and whether it was possible to unify the world of shells with a single equation. And he devised the following way of thinking about it as shown in this three-dimensional space shown on this graph, arraying shells into this space that he called a morpho space, a kind of uh, 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 a world of all the possible shapes that a shell might have. And he had three parameters in his equation. Uh, uh, one of them was what he called distance, and that's shown on the y-axis receding backwards. So the x-axis is in the front, the y-axis goes backwards, and the z-axis goes up and down. So in the y-axis, it's distance, and this is like a coil of stamps. You know, when you have a little roll of stamps, and then you can uncoil it or coil it tight. So that is a parameter as to how tightly is the shell coiled. And on the x-axis, what he called translation um, is like a spring. So this is, there's a spring, and you can have it, you can have the spring tight or loose, and it's like, how, how far is the spring displaced? And on the uh, z-axis, he had something called expansion. And that's the rate at which the opening of the shell in which the animal lives expands as you walk through the shell. For example, is it like a tunnel, like a cylinder, or is it like a cone getting smaller and smaller as you walk into the shell? And what rate does it get smaller at? So those three parameters, if you manipulate them, you can get all the shells that have ever existed you know, from, uh, from anemones to scallops to clams to snails and so on. And what he found was that when he created this morphospace, only a small part uh, of the uh, space was occupied. In other words, many types of shells that were theoretically conceivable never had come into existence. Only the gray part of the morphospace was occupied by real shells. Well, we could also imagine uh, similar axes for human societies. For example, how friendly is the society? How cooperative is the society? How unequal is the society? How hierarchical is the society? And we could create such axes in a multidimensional space and then go and look at what kinds of societies have ever been observed. And what we would find as I found looking at the shipwrecks and the communes and the scientific outposts and the online worlds and all of that other stuff, what we would find is that all observed societies occupy only a small part of this theoretical morphospace. Just a small part of all the kinds of societies and social orders that could have come into existence have come into existence. And the question is why? And the answer is natural selection. Now, the key capacities that we humans have that universally characterize our societies and that we need so as to be able to form a functional society are the following. Identity, love, friendship, networks, cooperation, in-group preference, mild hierarchy, and teaching. And I call these the social suite an ensemble of important attributes that human groups and societies need in order to be able to function effectively. Uh, Timothy, I just wanna check that you're still seeing these slides. It says the social suite right now. Yes, and we see all eight components. Thank you. And these are genetically encoded attributes shaped by natural selection that we express among ourselves, not as isolated individuals. Note that all of these traits, I will argue, are partially genetically encoded. They are shaped by natural selection, and they are traits that are not possible within single individuals. They require groups of individuals in order to be manifested. 
and they are adaptively useful, even crucial for making a society. In fact, natural selection has shaped not just the structure and function of our bodies, not just the structure and function of our minds and hence our behaviors, but also the structure and function of our societies. And I emphasize that these good traits can be put to good or bad use, just like a gun can be used to hunt birds or to murder humans. A group can be friendly within itself, but in the service of warlike behavior towards others, for example. And these traits are universal. They are seen in every society. Let's just let's look at just a few of them in the time we have today. One of the greatest paradoxes about mammalian social life is that the capacity to be a distinctive individual is actually an essential predicate for living socially. In other words, the ability to express and to recognize individuality only evolves when it's beneficial. And these two capacities are extremely rare in the animal kingdom. In other words, we have evolved the capacity to signal our identity, to say, this is me, I'm a unique person, and we use our faces to do that. Uh, and others have evolved the capacity to detect that. A big part of our brain is devoted to detecting the facial appearance of others and telling the difference between other people. Why would evolution have endowed us with this capacity to signal our unique identity and to detect the unique identity of others? Well, if you do not want others to attack you mistakenly or to forget that they had sex with you or to provide parental care to a different child and thus neglect you as an infant or to neglect to repay your kindness to them, then it is advantageous to have some way to signal this is me, not someone else, and to have other people recognize that signal. In other words, social interactions require that we have the ability to communicate and detect our individuality. And as I said, in our species, we use our faces for this purpose. Their unique appearance, the fact that every person's face is different, and our cognitive ability to detect such differences is actually an evolutionary luxury. We, we have evolved a, over many millions of years this, this demanding capacity that takes a lot of our brain power uh, and a lot of our energy precisely because it's useful. Now this comes about, this facial uniqueness comes about in part because in our faces, variation in any one trait, like the width of your nose or the height of your nose or the shape of your ears or the angle of your cheekbone and so on, or the height of your forehead is completely independent of variation in other traits. So for example, if you look at, um, uh, um, uh, 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 at the hands on the right, if you measure the width of a person's hand and the length of their hand, as hands get bigger, uh, there's a correlation between those two traits. So hand width and hand height are correlated, but nose width and nose height are not correlated. There's no relationship between the two. So what that means is, is that all of these different properties of our faces, which are uncorrelated with each other, have many possible combinations to create unique faces. We actually evolved, there's actually the, the genetics of this has been worked out recently or is increasingly worked out that there's tremendous genetic variability that underlies our phenotypic variability in our faces. Whereas, whereas our hands, you know, all look very similar from person to person. In other words, while your kidneys should in principle all work alike, all the kidneys of all the students in this class ideally should work the same way, all the faces of all the students in this class ideally should not be the same. They should look different from each other. Love is another universal trait. Our species is unusual among mammals in that we don't just have sex with our mates, we bond with them. We feel we form a sustained emotional attachment to them. We love them. And love is not essential to mating, but we do it anyway. 
in part because it helps us to raise our young. And in fact, love is inescapable even in war. I don't know, you, you, you probably have been seeing this, but there are many videos and photographs of couples uh, in the Ukrainian army in the territorial defense that are getting married right now on the battlefield. On the left here, we have Lesia and Valeri, uh, who just got married uh, next to the front line in Kyiv. Uh, they are with the territorial defense. And uh, I don't know the names of the Ukrainian couple on the right, but they also just agreed to be married. And I love on the soldier on the right, I love how he's holding the flowers behind his back along with the uh, with a submachine gun that's or the machine gun that's right there uh, behind him as well. They're very moving, these images, and very powerful illustrations of the central importance of love in human social order, even in the presence of evil. And even though marriage systems vary around the world, as shown here, this fundamental fact of bonding and love does not vary. So there are different kinds of ways of organizing marital life in cultures around the world. Monogamy on the far left, polygyny, one man, many wives in the middle, or polyandry, one woman, many husbands on the right, different kinds of marriage systems around the world. That varies, but the love that partners have for each other does not vary. Now, we don't just mate with each other, we also befriend each other. And humans are unusual as a species in that we form long-term non-reproductive unions with unrelated individuals. We do something very unusual in the animal kingdom. Namely, we have friends. We form long-term non-reproductive associative unions with other people who are not our kin. And, and this capacity for friendship is seen in every society, but it's quite rare in the animal kingdom. And the key attributes of friendship are also quite consistent around the world. For example, they include mutual aid, we help our friends, or positive affect. Uh, around the world, people feel good about their friends and they feel good in the presence of their friends. It's natural to seek the company of your friends and to feel good when you're with your friends. And there are other traits that characterize friendship as well. And these natural tendencies are also fostered and are especially useful in a time of war, when we must work together in order to succeed. And we are seeing this very much in Ukraine at the moment. Now my laboratory uh, at Yale has fanned out around the world to study friendship and distinctly to map the social networks that such friendships give rise to. For instance, in one study, we compiled a photographic census of all adult Hadza. The Hadza are a, a people, a very ancient people that live in Tanzania around Lake Ayasi. There are only about a thousand of them left. They are hunter gatherers or foragers. They sleep out under the stars. They have no material possessions to speak of. We, we, had a, we made a photographic census of all adult Hadza uh, and printed them on these posters that you can see, uh, like little visa photographs printed on these posters of all thousand Hadza, like a Hadza Facebook. And we, we took it into the field in Tanzania and every Hadza person we could find, we asked them to identify who their friends are. And what we found uh, was that their patterns of friendship and social interaction are just like ours. Despite the fact that in the last 10,000 years, human beings have invented agriculture, we've invented cities, we've invented telecommunications, the networks that we make, the social networks, the face-to-face -face networks that we make are just like theirs. There's no difference mathematically between the structure of Hadza networks and modern, for example, networks in the United States. And my lab has asked people to identify their friends in a number of ways, and we have mapped social networks in many places to try to understand this. These are images of what such social networks can look like, where we've mapped them in Honduras and in India and Uganda, for example. Every dot is a person, and every line connecting the dots is a friendship or some kind of social connection between two people. And just by looking at these two, these three very different countries, you can see that the social structure as defined by the social networks 
is very, very similar. There's in fact a startling consistency and universality to network structure. And other work that my lab has done has looked at the genetics and evolutionary biology of friendship. How and why did we evolve to have friends? And how, um, how can we recognize our friends? How do we choose our friends, for example? What's the biology of that? Very pertinently, however, elephants and dolphins also have friends. So there are very few animals that have friendship in the animal kingdom. We do it. Certain other primates do it. Elephants do it, both Asian and African elephants, and certain cetacean species, certain kinds of whales like dolphins uh, do it. And amazingly, elephant and dolphin networks look very similar to ours, mathematically speaking. This is an elephant network that I've drawn here. Every dot's an elephant and the lines represent time that the elephants spent together. And our last known ancestor with elephants was 85 million years ago. But still, they make friends and networks in a way similar to ourselves, because natural selection has independently come up with this uncommon practice of friendship. And this is known as convergent evolution, when organisms independently evolve to be similar, solving similar challenges in similar ways. These two cute creatures shared a common ancestor over 200 million years ago that looked nothing like this, and yet they independently evolved in such a similar way in the more recent past. Now, we usually think about this process with respect to physical features, like how the body is shaped of these organisms, or in plants, you know, how different plants develop similar solutions to the problem of, of living in a dry, la dry land. They develop similar root systems, for example, independently evolving those. And we usually think about this process of convergent evolution with respect to physical features, but it's not limited in that way. This observation about the convergent evolution of friendship and social networks actually leads us to another paradox. Because to the extent that we can resemble animals in our propensity for friendship or other traits like cooperation, we gain insights into our common humanity. If we can share the capacity for friendship with elephants, we can surely share it universally with each other. Now, the actual structure of these networks that we make matters for our life experience. Think about these two objects. As you all learned in high school chemistry, they're both made of carbon. And on the left, you have graphite, which is soft and dark. And on the right, you have diamond, which is hard and clear. And, uh, and, and the, the, the structure of the way the carbon atoms are arranged in those two things, the graphite and the diamond, is different. The structure is different. You connect the carbon atoms one way, you get graphite, which is soft and gray. You connect the carbon atoms another way, you get diamond, which is hard and clear. And there are two key intellectual ideas here. First of all, these properties of softness and darkness and hardness and clearness do not reside in the carbon atoms. They are properties of the collection of carbon atoms. And second, the properties are different depending on how you connect the carbon atoms to each other. Connect them one way, you get one set of properties. Take the same carbon atoms and connect them another way, you get a different, uh, completely different set of properties. Similarly, the pattern of our connections among ourselves affects the properties of our social groups. It's the ties between people that make the whole greater than the sum of its parts. In fact, I would argue one of the features of Ukrainian resistance right now is the kind of specific kinds of connections that Ukrainians feel to each other that gives them new properties of bravery and resistance that they wouldn't otherwise have had. In fact, new properties such as cooperation can emerge because of the connections, because of the ties between people, and not necessarily because of the people themselves. So it's not just what's happening in the people around us that matters, whether they are smoking, for example, that might affect our, ability, our likelihood, of, you know, when your friends smoke, you might be more likely to smoke, 
or if your friends are happy, you might be more likely to happy, be happy. It's not just what's happening in those people that matters. It's the actual structure of the network that also matters. Our experience of the world depends on the actual structure of the ties around us near and far. And in fact, collective social structures can have emergent properties. And the social order that we are pre-wired to make a particular pattern of networks matters. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. Uh, this is one example of how a structure of a network might affect the property of, uh, of groups based on work by Brian Utzi and his colleagues. Uh, Brian became interested in the success or failure of Broadway musicals, these big musical theatrical productions in New York City that can cost hundreds of millions of dollars to produce. It's a very high risk thing to make a big Broadway musical, um, uh, like uh, Hamilton, for example. And, uh, and so you, you, a lot of people care about whether those Broadway musicals succeed or fail. And one of the explanations for the success or failure of Broadway musicals, and also, for example, scientific collaborations, groups of people that are working together to discover knowledge. So we have a couple of examples, groups of people producing Broadway shows, or groups of people trying to make scientific discoveries, or other kinds of groups of people, for example, engaged in resistance. Um, uh, we, we, we can look at these groups and try to understand how does network structure affect their ability to do what it is they're supposed to do. Uh, let me illustrate to you some results from Brian Utzi's work. So he quantified a property of the networks known as the density. So if you have, for example, on the far left, you have one, uh, you have the people that are putting on a show, the, the director, the actors, the musicians, the costume designers, the producer, and so on. Uh, and so in the middle, on the far left, you have one person and, and they have five other people in the, in the Broadway musical production company. And among those five people, there are five times four divided by two, 10 possible connections. And on the far left, none of those connections exist. So you have, as it shows at the bottom, 0% density. In the next cartoon over, four of the connections among the, those people exist. So you have four out of 10 or 40% density. And in the next cartoon over, all 10 of those connections exist. So you have 100% density. And what Utsi did is he plotted for about 326 Broadway musical production companies, he plotted on the x-axis the density that I just explained to you, and on the y-axis how successful was the Broadway musical. Uh, and he measured success in terms of how much money did it make and how favorable were the reviews. And what he found was this parabolic shape. So if the broad, if the people working on the show, nobody knew each other from before, the show was a flop, it was not successful. And at the other extreme, if the group putting on the show, everybody knew each other from before, the show was a flop on the far right. But if you had intermediate density, where some people knew each other from before and knew how to work together, and some people were new people in the group who maybe brought fresh ideas to the group, you got optimal performance in that parabola and you had the best success at the top. So people can be organized and connected in particular ways, and this affects what they are able to do. The organization has value. Let me show you another experiment uh, that we did in my laboratory, uh, and, and, and it relates to the ability to form and cut friendship ties, which is crucial to our ability to sustain cooperation. Um, what we did in this experiment is, is we took hundreds of people uh, using the software that I mentioned earlier, and we brought them into our online laboratory, and we put them into groups, for example, in the bottom. We made a little network, it's an Urgis Reni random graph with 30% tie saturation. It's what that graph looks like in the lower left. It's a mathematically generated graph, and we put people in specific locations in that network, and we introduced them to their neighbors. So each person had one, two, three, four, however many neighbors they had. And we said, okay, here are your neighbors. And we gave them some money. And we had them play an economic game called a public goods game, where they could either be nice to their neighbors and cooperate, be generous to their neighbors, or they could be mean to their neighbors and defect and not cooperate. And uh, the, the nice cooperative individuals are shown in blue, and the mean defecting individuals are shown in red on the lower left. 
And they played this game repeatedly across time. And what would happen is at the beginning in the lower left image, uh, in this network where everyone was you know, stuck with their neighbors for throughout the whole game, the fixed network, some people about two thirds started by being nice to their neighbor, they were blue, but their neighbors took advantage of them. So I generous to my neighbor, but then my neighbor defects and takes advantage of my generosity. And I get irritated by this. So then I say, well, you know, I'm gonna switch and be a defector too. I'm not gonna help my group either. And what you see is by the end across time in a widely reproduced result, cooperation collapses in this system. And everyone is a defector. If you can see all the red dots in on, over the number 10 in the lower right after the 10th round of this game, except for a few blue dots on the edge of this group keeping civilization alive, you know, working together to cooperate. It's a little bit like, I don't know if you do this in Ukraine, but in high school, when your teachers picks a group of four people or four students and says, okay, you have to go do a class project. And maybe a couple of the other students are lazy and don't do their work. And now if you're part of the not lazy student, they're defectors. And if you're a cooperative, nice student, you've got two choices. Either you do the work and everyone gets credit, which doesn't feel right, or you also are lazy and defect and don't do the work and then the whole group collapses. So that's what happens. Cooperation collapses in a fixed network. But in a different branch of our experiment, what we did is, is we created fluid networks where at every time step, we allowed people to cut ties to other people if they wish to, or form new ties to other people. And what happened in that world, when we had just a little bit of social fluidity was that People would cut ties to defecting mean individuals, selfish individuals. They would cut the ties and they would preferentially form ties with kind, unselfish individuals. And in that kind of world, cooperation persists. The point is, I can engineer a set of rules about human social structure, and I can take you students uh, and you people, and by putting you in one kind of arrangement, I can make you really sweet to each other. Or I can take you same people and put you in another arrangement and make you really mean to each other. So this meanness and this sweetness you see is not just a property of the individuals, it's a property of the collection of individuals and specifically how they are arranged. Now in a follow up experiment, we, uh, we, we swept the parameter space, we evaluated all the various amounts of social fluidity that were possible from 0% to 100%. So 0% is a fixed network, like I just told you about, no possibility of changing your social connections. 100% is all your social connections are changing every time and everything in between. We call this the rewiring rate at the bottom. How much are you allowed to rewire your social networks? Uh, that's on the X axis. And on the Y axis, we have a, a regression model based estimate of how cooperative are these groups of people. And once again, you can see this parabolic shape, very rigid networks where people are stuck with others, cooperation breaks down, and overly fluid networks where every day you have new people that you're connected to, cooperation breaks down. It's in the middle where you have some rigidity in the social networks, but also some fluidity that you get maximum amount of cooperation. And my laboratory has published quite a few papers on the origins of cooperation and how this relates to social structure uh, in the past decade. Now, another element of the social suite that I mentioned is, the, is what's called in-group bias. And it's the great loyalty that humans feel to their own groups. Now, one explanation for in-group bias both evolutionarily speaking and in our daily lived experience has to do with a conflict between groups. Conflict and competition over limited resources, land, food, money, prestige, can give rise to intergroup hostility and provide an explanation for the feelings of prejudice and discrimination towards outgroups. In a very famous demonstration that was done in the summer of 1954, a psychologist, Muzaffar Sharif, and his colleagues took a group of 22 10-year-old boys who were strangers to each other and sent them to a camp in Robbers Cave 
State Park in Oklahoma in the middle of the United States uh, in a very famous demonstration of this idea. And the boys were deliberately isolated from the outside world. And the experiment proceeded in three careful stages over three weeks. In the first stage, the two boys who didn't know each other from before were camped in separate areas, unaware of the existence of another group. And they, and this fostered group solidarity. They made up names for themselves. For example, one group of boys called themselves the Eagles, and another group of boys called themselves the Rattlers after a kind of snake. And they engaged in uh, activities that fostered in-group solidarity and identification, like designing team t-shirts and flags for themselves. In the second stage, the scientists brought the groups of boys into competition with each other. In two groups, uh, they competed in zero-sum games, like tug of war, for example, or football, or tent pitching competitions. By the end of the second stage of the experiment, the investigators had accomplished their objective. There were two distinct groups with an unmistakable state of friction with one another. They hated each other, these two groups of boys. And then the experiments did the final stage, which was designed to see how uh, or if non-hostile groups uh, could be made to work together, could be, was designed to see whether now hostile groups, groups that had been made hostile to each other, could be made to work together, effacing the negative attitudes towards the outgroup. And what the scientists did is they sabotaged a huge water tank that fed the entire camp. And it was located uphill about a mile away from the camp. And the boys were divided into details and sent to search the plumbing lines from the camp up to the tank with plans to meet at the tank. And when they got there up the hill to this tank, as designed, the boys were very thirsty for the lack of water. And they turned on a faucet on the tank to drink, but no water came out because the scientists had sabotaged it. And then something amazing happened. They began to work together, all of these boys who previously hated each other. They climbed into the top of the tank with a ladder and they found that they found nearby and they ascertained that the tank in fact did have water and they began to collaborate to unplug the faucet. And after they succeeded, they began to intermingle in ways that had not been seen before, and they came to like each other. And this is like the divisions in Ukraine, falling away once Russia invaded, right? Ukraine is united against a common enemy. Any divisions that existed in the society before in Ukraine, along any kind of line, are now of much less importance. And Ukraine is showing tremendous solidarity, partly as an illustration of the phenomenon that I've just mentioned. Now, the traits that make up the social suite, uh, and Timothy, now we're seeing again the list, is that right? Exactly. Thank you. The traits that make up the social suite are mutually supportive. Many of these play roles in the others. So for example, identity is crucial for every one of these. When you love your partner, you know who he or she is, right? You don't love this person today and then forget who they are and love someone else tomorrow. No, you have a sustained relationship. Same with friendship. Identity is crucial for all of these. Friendship and networks are crucial for cooperation, as I showed you. In-group preference is crucial for cooperation, too. I didn't tell you much about mild hierarchy, but it also relates to these others. And in fact, there's a final element of the social suite, which is, um, which is teaching which I'd like to say a few words by. I'm gonna say a few words about teaching, and then I'm gonna close with two final big ideas, and then we can have some time for, for conversation. Uh, teaching, you see, lies at the root of our capacity for culture. Most animal can, animals can learn, right? Animals learn by contact with their environment. For example, a little fish in the sea can learn, but if it swims up to the light, it will find food there. This is called independent learning where an organism learns on its own by contact with the environment. Now, some animals can also learn uh, socially. For example, if you put your hand in the fire, you learn that it burns, and that's independent learning. Or you can put your hand in the fire, and I watch you, and I learn that fire burns, but I don't pay any of the price. In other words, I learn, I acquire almost as much knowledge, fire burns, but pay none of the price. This kind of social learning is incredibly efficient, in other words. Or for example, we go into the forest 
you eat red mushrooms and you die. I watch you eat the red mushrooms and die. And now I learn that red mushrooms, mushrooms are poisonous, but I pay none of the price. So this kind of social learning is incredibly efficient and many animals do that. But we humans do something else that's extraordinarily rare in the animal kingdom. We not only uh, observe each other, we set out to teach each other things. In other words, I not only watch you build a fire, you try to teach me to build a fire. And this is incredibly rare in the animal kingdom. This ability allows us to cumulatively create and store knowledge and transmit it across network ties uh, and across time and place. And it allows us to be cultural animals, in other words. And the knowledge that we transmit across time and space in the form of teaching is a fundamental driver of economic growth and security, right? When we work together, for example, to defend ourselves, we pass along information among ourselves in a way that's advantageous to the whole group. And it turns out this capacity for culture shapes us even more because our genes affect our capacity for teaching and social learning and the creation of culture. And then culture affects our genes. Now, the best example so far of how macro historical developments like cultural innovations could affect our genes is the best example of this so far is the evolution of lactose tolerance in adults. Lactose is a, uh, a sugar in milk. Uh, it is digested in our body. It's broken down by an enzyme called lactase. And the ability of adults to digest lactose can only confer evolutionary advantages when a stable supply of milk is available, such as after milk producing animals were domesticated. In other words, way in the past, before 10,000 years ago, um, little babies had lactase in their bodies because they were drinking their mother's breast milk and they needed to digest that source of nutrition. And then when they were weaned, when they were no longer breastfeeding, they lost the capacity to, to digest milk. Why? Well, because they never drank milk again in their lives. In the ancestral past, humans only drank milk when they were babies. There was no need to digest milk if you were 20 or 40 years old, 50 or 100,000 years ago, because you never drank any milk. But beginning between three and 9,000 years ago, in multiple locations around the world, humans domesticated milk producing animals like cattle and sheep and goats and camels, for example. And suddenly there was milk in our environment. So those among us who retained the ability to digest lactose by keeping our lactase enzyme going in our bodies into adulthood, those of us who had mutations that allowed us to do that suddenly had a survival advantage compared to other humans who lacked those enzymes. In other words, we humans invented something, a new technology, we domesticated animals and we invented milk production. And because of that cultural innovation, we changed the environment around us and created a new Darwinian fitness pressure on us, which reshaped the trajectory of human evolution such that billions of people on the planet today are different genetically than they would have been, meaning they can digest milk as adults, than they, uh, than they would have been had we not made this cultural innovation. And, and research has shown that these mutations are principally seen in populations who are herders and not in nearby populations who are otherwise very similar, who retained a hunter-gatherer lifestyle in various studies done in Africa. In, in summary of this part of what I'm saying, the point is that something we learn to do changes the course of our evolution. Our genes and our culture are in a conversation, and there are many amazing examples of this uh, in, uh, in Blueprint, uh, which, as I said, is going to be translated into Ukrainian, hopefully before too long. Now, I want to close with two final ideas um, about, about social order and its value. The first has to do with why we live in groups in the first place. Now, a key reason for why we live in groups has to do with the idea known as social capital. And to get to understand one sense of this, consider this idea. 
What is the point of a connected life? How does it, how does it help us as uh, individuals and as a species? And it turns out that networks are a resource we can all use. Networks are a kind, social networks, face-to-face -face ne networks are a kind of social capital. Now, most people, when they think of capital, think of money, but really capital is any stock of resources that can be put to productive use. In other words, uh, capital is, a, is, a, is a, a set of resources that you can do something with. And two further key ideas about capital are that in order to create capital, you have to invest skill and effort, you have to know something and do something. And the second very subtle idea about capital that I've been thinking about for 20 years now is that in order to create capital, you have to make changes in a substance that make it yield a higher rate of return than it otherwise would. You have to modify the substance in order to make it more productive. What do I mean by that? Well, a farm is a stock of capital. By investing labor and skill to clear the forest, one makes land, farm, that is more productive of, of fruits and vegetables and grains, for example. So land, especially improved land, is a form of capital. Or consider this idea. You have a tree. You invest skill and effort, and you transform the tree into lumber. And the lumber is more valuable than the tree because you can do things with the lumber you couldn't do with a tree. Namely, invest still more skill and effort and make it into a violin. And a violin is more valuable than the lumber because you can do things with the violin that you couldn't do with the lumber, namely make music. At each step of the way, you invest skill and <coughs> you invest skill and effort. At each step of the way, you invest skill and effort and you transform one thing into another thing, making that thing a reservoir of wealth and a source of productive power. So capital is a change that allows a substance to act in new ways. And that is part of what makes it a store of wealth and a source of productive power. <clears throat> now, a key innovation in, in thinking in the social sciences took place in the 1960s, principally spearheaded by Gary Becker, an economist at Chicago and others, to see people and their skills and talents as a form of human capital. And a chief example of this is education. So for example, on the far left, I have a former graduate student of mine who in that image is a drunkard. Uh, he's dissolute. You can see his uh, beer cans and his toothpick and so on. You can invest skill and effort and clean him up. So he's no longer a drunkard in the middle. And then you can invest still more skill and effort and give him an education as shown on the far right. At each step of the way, we work on this person uh, like I am doing so right now. We change his mind. I'm investing skill and effort by being a teacher, and I'm hopefully transforming your minds. And that is making you more powerful and more capable than you were before. Uh, so uh, this, this process of teaching, you see, is a process of creating social capital by modifying the minds of other people. Well, just like physical capital is created by a change in the material world, and human capital by a change in persons, social capital in organizations, in companies, in towns, in communities, in fact, in a whole society, is a change in the relations among persons, a change that renders the group more productive and capable of doing things it was not previously able to do. And I think that's one of the things that's happening in Ukraine right now under this incredible threat the, the group, the, the people in Ukraine are reforming themselves, uh, teaching the, each other things, forming social connections, acting in a way that makes them capable of doing things they were not previously able to do. If physical capital is wholly tangible and human capital is less tangible, like skills and knowledge, social capital being embedded in social relations is less tangible still. Now that is the deepest account I can give you of what social networks mean for our lives and why it is that we can use them to make the world better. Now, last, our focus on the social origins 
of goodness highlights one final idea. Most human virtues are social and arise from investment in the lives of others. We do not care very much if you love yourself or are kind to yourself or are just to yourself. We care whether you manifest these virtues to others. Do you love others? Are you kind to others? Are you just to others? These virtues, not all virtues, but most social virtues are intrinsically social in nature. And in fact, President Zelensky has been making some of these arguments in many of his speeches, arguing about the social nature of human virtue. Well, what accounts for our species' general success in living together in the face of all of our defects and differences? How can we understand the goodness of the social world despite the badness? Now in theology, this is known as a question of theodicy, it comes from the Greek word, a theodiki, the, the, the rightness of God, the, the, how, do we, how do we explain, you know, how can we justify God despite uh, all of the evil that is present in the world. I believe analogous to theodicy, an idea found in theology, that we can focus on what I call sociodicy. This is the vindication of our confidence in the virtue of society, despite its numerous failures that are so obvious to anyone. And this idea is in keeping with the Japanese aesthetic philosophy of wabi-sabi, highlighting the flawed beauty of natural and artificial things. So for example, if, if I look at this Japanese bowl, I think it's beautiful. Maybe you do too. It's a beautiful bowl, even though it's imperfect. It's completely different than the kind of perfect Chinese porcelain we see in many Western museums. To the Japanese eye and to my eye, and maybe to yours, this bowl also has beauty despite or maybe because of its imperfections. Now, this is not just idle optimism. Rather, it's a recognition of the fundamental good that lies within us. It's tempting to look at human history as full of abject misery and dysfunction. One can pick any century or millennium and find it replete with horrors, with warfare, as you're seeing now, with reckless violence, as you're seeing now, but with slavery and pogroms and colonialism and all kinds of awful evils stretching back centuries and millennia. It's, this is also a part of the human experience. Now, there was, a, of course, a dramatic inflection for the better that occurred in the 18th century with the arrival of the Enlightenment in Europe and its philosophical values and scientific discoveries. And as a result of a kind of shift in perception, in philosophical perception of the Enlightenment, in the equality of human beings, and in notions of democratic governance, which are part of the Enlightenment heritage, and also a shift in, um, in scientific discoveries and an appreciation for the natural world in physics and chemistry and biology and so on, because of those philosophical and scientific advances, you know, the steam engine and the recognition, uh, you know, by Darwin uh, and, and Adam Smith and all of these, you know, scientific discoveries and ultimately Einstein and so on, of course, that's later than the Enlightenment, uh, because of these philosophical innovations and scientific discoveries, life became longer and richer and freer and generally more peaceful. But my argument is, and of course, there are bumps more than bumps with the awfulness that we're seeing right now in Ukraine. But generally the trajectory has been improving for the last couple of hundred years. And this is partly one of the reasons I think Ukraine will be victorious against Russia, because Russia is in, is in essence engaged in an anti-enlightenment kind of project and is swimming against the tide of history. But my argument is we do not have to rely solely on such recent historical developments to make the world better. And as I've been showing you, more ancient and more powerful and deeper forces are at work, stretching back hundreds of thousands of years, not just hundreds of years, propelling a good society. In short, the arc of our evolutionary history is long, but it bends towards goodness. Thank you.
Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent lecture. Um, as always, you have been very eloquent, uh, you know, talking about such complicated concepts as friendship, social capital. It's never easy to talk about them, and you always manage. We have several questions already. Um, I will prioritize questions from students and then our professors, and then I will ask a couple of my questions because I just want to, you know, take advantage of my role as a moderator. So our student uh wants to clarify about your eight components of the social suit because basically he's asking why eight uh perhaps some of them are redundant maybe you missed something so maybe you can clarify you know how did you come up with this team is this theory driven empirically driven uh why eight and no nine or seven thank you it was uh, mostly empirically driven i couldn't find any others to add if the student has some ideas about something i've overlooked I'd be happy. I don't think they're redundant with each other. Uh, the eight are not redundant. Whether there are others to add, I don't think so either, although there might be. One question I get often asked is, what about religion? You know, why isn't religion on the list? And there's a lot of research on the evolutionary biology of religion. Why do we humans have a belief in supernatural powers, for example? It's a very distinctive thing that we do. But the thing about religion, the reason religion is not on the list is religion is something you can also do as an individual. You can feel spiritual, you can pray to God, you don't need other people to do that. So other kinds of things that are important to human beings, for example, another question I get asked is what about, for example, risk assessment? What about the human capacity to uh, intuitively or formally uh, measure risks? Again, while that is important, like religion to social life, and for example, to modern economies, you can do risk assessment on your own. Uh, an animal can assess what to do on its own. So the, the ones that I picked are, are attributes that are uh, require others, first point. Second point, I picked ones that have some evolutionary basis. So for example, clothing, the fact that we dress ourselves uh, is, is a universal, uh, but, um, but it's not evolutionary. To my knowledge, there are no genes that specify that you wear clothes, uh, for example. So the, 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 uh, the rules for what I picked are that it's evolutionarily based, has some genetic element, uh, is uh, social in nature, not just individual. And of course, I'm highlighting the traits that are required for a good society uh, to, to live together. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we have another professor of Kiev School of Economics. He also um, suggested three questions, but we will start just uh, with one. Um, so, uh, yeah, I can read it, but Nicholas, you can try to. Yeah, Nicholas, please unmute yourself. I think you're allowed. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm allowed, yes. <clears throat> uh, so, thank you very much for, for this. It was uh, uh, very interesting, very enlightening. Uh, so, uh, so I, I could ask you like many things, but I'll ask one due to the moderator. So, there's a, a bit of like you have in your experiments, right? You have the shipwrecks, you have the submarines, and these they already have an existing hierarchy on the on the social structure there. Uh, and I mean, I remember from Gun Germs and Steel, for example, in the Polynesian expansion, there was this experiment in which they went to two different islands with like a different uh, different uh, geography, and then one became agriculture based, the other one remained hunter gatherer or something like this. Uh, but you can also think that Jewish people being persecuted, communism, and so on. And all of these are like affecting the initial states or, or they shock the structure of a society. And, and this kind of determines a bit uh, like the, 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 the future dynamics of it. I mean, do, what do we know of these changes on how, how, it, how, how it affects the, the long run kind of uh, structure of society? That's a very good question, and you're absolutely right that in the natural experiments, like the shipwrecks, um, are not are not the ideal experiment that we would want, right? Because, for example, the people that were wrecked are not average people; they're sailors or soldiers. Uh, most of the shipwrecks are mostly men, so the gender ratio is uh, very skewed. Uh, they're not a natural gender ratio. Uh, they, these people are already accustomed to hierarchy, as you mentioned, on the boats are very hierarchical, the organization, they're officers and crew or passengers and so on. So the shipwreck is just one example. And that's why my laboratory has been doing experiments. I showed you some in which we take thousands of people and we 
control. We set the initial conditions. We, for example, we specify the structure of the network, or we've done other experiments, for example, I might be able to show you some slides, but I won't. Uh, we had a paper in, uh, I think it was uh, uh, 2015, I can't remember when it was, in the journal Nature, where we, um, where we created artificial societies of real people and we experimentally manipulated the amount of economic inequality. So we, we had a certain amount of money, and in some societies we set the Gini coefficient to zero, everyone had the same, and in other societies we set the Gini coefficient to 0 0.2, sort of like Scandinavia, and in other societies we set the Gini coefficient to 0 0.4, like the economic inequality in the United States or in Morocco, and then and the, the total amount of wealth was the same in all the societies, but we manipulated how unequally it was distributed. People were randomly assigned to be rich or poor, they were introduced to their neighbors, and then we had them play these public goods games, these cooperation games, for example, and we could test how does the inequality affect the capacity of the society to work together, to be cooperative, to make friendships, and uh, so on. So there is an example of how we manipulate the initial conditions experimentally to, um, to be able to make some of the claims that we make. So you're completely right. The initial conditions are very important, um, and they matter. Uh, and, um, and, and evolution is a dynamic process, evolution both within groups and, of course, across the sweeps of time, thousands of years. Uh, but our experiments allow us to drill down on that. Did I answer your question? No, no. I mean, I, I, it's not a, a critique on that. It's just like, what do we know of this? You know, what do we know of oh. the fact that uh, that uh, Jewish were oppressed? I mean, how they, that that affects yes. uh, this? I mean, it's not yes. it's not a critique on the on the experiment. It's more of a no, like, no. I wasn't. Was the bottom line? Yeah. I, I wasn't taking it as a criticism at all. I was trying to provide more information. I'm completely undefensive about these no, things. No, no, or, or thinking with the shipwrecks, right? I mean, in yeah. one you had the captain, in the other one you didn't. I mean, what happened? This yeah, happened. so uh, in the shipwrecks, one of the things I can tell you about the shipwrecks that's very funny is that one of the things that was associated with failure, an initial condition was associated with failure, was when, whether any alcohol washed ashore. If, if some alcohol was salvaged, much worse for the shipwreck uh, over time. Often you get cannibalism and all kinds of problems when, when alcohol. So, so the initial salvage was very important. On the other hand, a big thing associated with success is whether they had a blacksmith. So if one of the people in the crew knew how to forge metal uh, so they could make nails to make a boat uh, and a bellows, if they knew how to make a bellows to get the heat required, they would, they would slaughter seals and then make use the seal skin to make a bellows to get hot fires this was associated with success so so initial conditions are very important and and um and so yes i mean this is a cultural quality like you mentioned the the jewish diaspora for example and the experience of of jews th through european history or frankly throughout time or other kinds like uh you know like for example the predicament in ukraine right now no doubt also traces its history back to the specifics of stalinism so so yes, the initial conditions are are clearly important uh, um, in these types of social arrangements. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And I will um, keep going with um, my own question, and then we would have time. Uh, Nicholas can ask more. Um, so, yeah, I also have a lot of questions, of course, but I will try to ask those that can somehow navigate our discussion. You know, to connect your big story with something that, that we observe now in Ukraine and uh, the Russia's Russian invasion. So, you know, I'm a sociologist and I am really focused on policy dimension of sociology. We, we work with the government, we work with local communities and, you know, for our listeners abroad, I, I can tell about uh, a very interesting experience of what we have seen here in Ukraine. Uh, five, six years ago, we have launched, well, our government ha has launched this um, reform of decentralization, which allowed a much uh, broader, um, well, basically this reform allowed communities to take care for themselves. Yeah, so they received a lot of uh, sovereignty. They, they decide, now local communities were able to decide, you know, how to spend budgets. Local communities started to participate in um, collective decision-making things like that. So this really boosted social capital in Ukraine at the local level. So I'm not surprised by this capacity of Ukrainians to organize and resist and be resilient. Uh, but this is just, you know, my 
a little introduction and a segue to, to my real question. And my real question would be, do you, can you speculate or theorize how can we actually um, connect your big story with some practical policy tools? Can we actually enhance better society by somehow you know, creating <laughs> networks of friendship or, or love? Uh, because in your previous books, when you were writing about obesity, yeah, you, you provided this practical recommendation that people should uh, create this collective uh, networks of support to, 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 to look for diet together and to exercise together. So maybe you can also uh, theorize uh, how, to, how to achieve this um, better society from, from the policy perspective. So, yes, <clears throat> I mean, there are two different issues. Are there lessons from network science that would be useful in, practically useful in, in the Ukrainian resistance to the invasion right now? And the, and the answer is yes. And some of those ideas, although we do theoretical and applied research in my laboratory, I haven't talked to you about all the work that we do, but there are ideas about how to organize groups and how to facilitate the flow of information um, we've been doing some work on misinformation. Of course, there's a cyber war that's taking place right now as well. Some of our ideas about the, we had a paper on uh, what causes the flow of accurate and inaccurate information online. I didn't talk about that today. That's a paper I did with uh, Hiro Shirado, uh, S-H-I-R-A-D-O. Uh, so we have some work that is immediately relevant, but but the issue is, is the broader uh, issue in terms of uh, uh, how, what is the relevance of what I've said today for social order from a policy point of view? And here I would say that forms of social order that politicians or totalitarians attempt to impose on a society that go against the social suite are doomed to failure. So you, you can apply a tremendous cultural or political force to restrain it. For example, in many, um, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Chinese society during communist times, uh, everyone was supposed to dress the same, right? Everyone was comrade. You're all supposed to uh, uh, you know, be the same and reduce individual identity. Just people don't like that. They are individuals. They like to recognize other people's individuals. Eventually they like to express their individual identity. Or during East Germany with the Stasi, they tried to make everyone suspicious. People were not supposed to have friends. You're supposed to be suspicious of your friends and break down the family. You're supposed to owe your allegiance to the state, right? Not to your family and to your friends, for example. And it worked for a while, right? With tremendous force, but you cannot stop it. You cannot suppress it. And there are many examples I talk about in Blueprint. For example, in the Israeli kibbutzes in the, in the 20th century, they tried to have communal child rearing. The, the burden on women of giving birth to children and breastfeeding them and caring for them has the, the disparate burden compared to men has been noted for thousands of years. And for thousands of years, people have proposed, why don't we just have like a communal, like a nursery? And when children are born, the families can put the children there and they'll be raised by someone else and they'll visit the children. Uh, and, uh, and then that way women can be freed from this uh, domestic burden. Every single time that's been tried, it collapsed. Uh, it, 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 you can't push away against the family unit uh, for very long. I mean, now there are certain exceptions, which I discuss in Blueprint in detail. For example, there's one society that emphasizes, that tries to suppress love and emphasizes sexual behaviors rather than, than love, uh, privileges sex rather than love. Uh, it's a society called the Na in, uh, in, in China. And, um, but even in that society, there are young couples these, these children, these women and men can have sex with whoever they want, and they're very promiscuous uh, under certain rules, very strict rules that are in the society. But um, even in that society, there's some young couples that say, we don't want to have free sex. We are just love each other. We're going to run away not to have sex with each other, but we're going to run away to love each other, you know, violating the, the norm. So my point is, is that forms of political organization that support and work with the social suite, many of which, by the way, are the norms of civil society. For example, freedom of assembly and freedom of expression are a manifestation of our taste for friendship. Freedom of assembly, you get to pick your own friends. 
a freedom of expression. That's teaching. We get to teach each other things. The flow of knowledge should be open. Many of these political ideas that work with the social suite are powerful and are sustainable. But political arrangements that try to suppress the social suite, which is part of our heritage, um, won't be successful. Yeah, I, I really like your message because so many people are discussing, um, you know, societal developments and social order more from the perspective of social Darwinism. Yeah, that you have to be tough and aggressive in order to win this competition. And uh, apparently, your story is completely different. Yes, that social suit in the long run makes our societies uh, not only better morally but stronger and more fit to survival. And I think this is a yes. very powerful lesson. And from uh, that perspective, I want to ask my final question, and then maybe we can ask uh, our students again. So can we also talk about Russia and Russian protests? Eh? Because the society there is very structured. Uh, there are many different um, social groups, uh, working class, yuppies, uh, intellectuals, military. Uh, and it seems that there are so many different bubbles of information, and all these bubbles uh, behave in different ways. You know, Some people who are in denial, other people, they actually want to stand up against the regime, but they don't have means or they don't know how to organize. Uh, some people support the regime. Yeah, So there are a lot of different social networks there, right, in Russia. Maybe you can comment somehow broadly. Do you, what I, I don't, of course, we cannot intervene and, and I don't, I even don't know what can we do uh, to help Russians, but maybe you can comment on, you know, on the success of the protest, what kind of social networks, what kind of organization uh, must be implemented in order for protests to succeed, what kind of information communication program can we implement to talk to these uh, people who are in different bubbles in order to, you know, convey our message to these people. Um, yeah, can you just broadly respond to my uh, broad question? Um, <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm heartbroken by what the Russians are doing. I've, I've been to Russia three times. I've been to Moscow, St. Petersburg. I've been to Russian Orthodox monasteries in the hinterlands. Before I went the first time, I spent six months learning Russian. Of course, like every other human on the planet, I read Russian novels, you know, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. You know, the history of Russia is a profound history as well. And um, and I like Russian art and Russian icons and and Anna Akhmatova's poems, you know, and uh, you know, it's it's very depressing to see the Russians also in this situation. And, and they are being brought low by their own totalitarian regime. As you say, there are many, many millions of Russians who don't like uh, what's happening and are ashamed uh, and don't want any part of this. They don't want their, their country <laughs> invading Ukraine in a fratricidal war, it's, it's absurd. So, but I don't know, you know, I think the, the to throw off a totalitarian yoke requires a tremendous amount of bravery and organization and luck. And, um, and a lot depends on how, you know, how brutal Putin is going to be. Uh, and I think in the end, for reasons I mentioned earlier, I think Ukraine will, will win. Um, I think Russia has embarked on a calamitous war that will um, set it back a very long time, um, politically, militarily, economically, morally. Um, you know, they they went from, you know, Zhukov marching in Red Square after the end of the Second World War to sending you know tanks into Ukraine. So, so it is a you know it is it is a calamity for the whole world. Most of all, it's a calamity for Ukraine. It's a calamity for Russia, and it's a calamity for for democratic values and 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 moral principles around the world. What's happening now? How how Russia, how the Russian people can make themselves heard, or what we can do to help them? I think we can we can do the kinds of things many Ukrainians are doing. For example, the Russian language, the the Russian language uh, stuff that the President Zelensky speaks in Russian that many Ukrainians speak in Russian that, you know, that can get across. 
the uh, the humor, even the humor, you know, these the, the Ukrainian the Ukrainian tractors that are pulling the tanks. You know, you think those images don't go viral in Russia? You think those people are people can see the image of the Ukrainian farmer pulling the Russian tank and say, well, wait a minute, what's going on? What's going on in this picture? You know, uh, I think fostering connections between individuals in Russia, the, the way totalitarianism works. One of the ways is it wants every individual to be oriented up to the state. And what you need to do in a network sense is foster ties at this level, like between people. My laboratory, the work, some of the work I did with my colleague James Fowler 20 years ago was very useful to President Obama in his first election. Because prior to that, people thought the purpose of a political campaign was to, was to foster connections between, between the voters. So here is the candidate, and then these are the voters. And the point of a campaign was to create these connections between the candidate and the voters. But really what you want to do is you want to foster connections between the voters. So what you want to do as a campaign is make the voters connected to each other so that they move together to the polls or vote together, for example. So I think one of the things that's very important for, for pushback in civil society in Russia is to form these lateral connections among citizens and among the groups uh, that are in Russia themselves. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I also believe that we have seen that the amount of protests has the amount has increased significantly, perhaps some, some improvement in the organization and density and hierarchy can happen. Well, I, uh, I hope so. Um, yeah, we still have a few questions in the chat uh, from Nicholas. Um, uh, Nicholas, do, do you want to ask them? If I mean, you don't mind. I, I think we, we still have uh, time. Yeah, we have maybe five minutes, five, seven minutes. So Nicholas, please, one question. No, it's fine. I'm, okay. I'm, at your dis I'm at your disposal. I'm happy to stay as long as you want, Timothy. Just let me know when you want to stop. No, we, we can go Okay, so I, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do this. It can, so they're both a bit wonkish and not, not probably the best way to, to, to finish the, the thing. So I'll, I'll, I'll throw them and then if, if you don't want to end on this, it, it's fine. But so two things. Like, uh, you said that, uh, I mean, basically these uh, features that we have of, of how, how the network structure, like we share with elephants and dolphins, right? And they're both also have about the same brain capacity as we do. They just don't kind of communicate uh, as far as I know. I mean, not a specialist. But is this because this at this point, there's some break in our capacity to recognize faces, for example, or to remember faces or, or something of the sort? I mean, I, I, have we understood what was the issue there? Why, why, why is that the case? Um, and then, I'm sorry, Nicholas, I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question. You're saying, what is it extra that we have compared to elephants and dolphins that makes us no, better no, no, able? No. What, what do we share? What do we share with them? Because you said that All of that. Society, uh, we, we share with them a bit the structure, right? We know we share uh, all of the social, we share all of the social suite with them, which is amazing. Yeah, that, that's my point. That's my point. Yes. yes. But I mean, we, we, they also have uh, the highest brain capacity uh, among animals, right? Yes. Uh, and very, and as, as far as I know, elephants are close to us even. Uh, so is this the fact that we share the same brain capacity and the, and the same social structure? Is this because we're able to recognize me, we and elephants and dolphins? Can we recognize faces better? Can we remember people better than animals with, with different social structure and different brain capacity in a way? I'm not sure I've understood your question, but if you're asking, all of these mammals with big brains are social mammals. And, and there's an yeah. argument that, that increasing living socially requires a big brain and having a big brain makes it possible to live socially. So there's a feedback loop across evolution. Uh, the, the, the social suite is present in elephants and in dolphins and in humans and in, and in chimpanzees, for example. So all of those things, uh, the animal, uh, uh, well, love is a little special case, uh, the sentimental attachment, but identity, friendship, teaching, hierarchy, most of those things are present, but to a lesser extent, 
uh, in all of those examples that I gave. And the argument but, but, is... But what's the channel? What's the channel? Well, I mean, what happens is... is remember each other better. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's, it's not just that. It, the identity is present in all of them. The point is, what happens is, is, is there's runaway convergent evolution. As a mammalian species begins to live socially, it creates, and this is all described in the book, it creates an environment that, that is better fit for animals that can live socially. So what happens is that each generation, so example, friendly animals do better in friendly societies and friendly societies make it easier for friendly animals. So once you embark on this path towards living socially, uh, you, we all converge on the same solution. Elephants converge on the solution, dolphins and we do, for example, on the same kind of solution that involves the, the social suite. This is different, by the way, than the use social insects. Our way of living socially is different than, than, than ants and wasps and, and bees and, and so on, partly because those animals are much more genetically related uh, than we are. So they have a different challenge. Those, those use social insects are, 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 are not quite clones, but they are, they're all like sisters to each other uh, or more. And so they're not trying to solve a social problem among unrelated individuals. So, uh, so if I've understood your question, the question is, uh, why is it that we all come to such a similar solution? And the answer is convergent evolution. Uh, you know, that we, we, we wind up evolving the social suite independently in different animal species because of the specific challenges in living socially that require all of these features to work together. Thank you very much. Uh, so, super interesting. Well, I'm, I'm really happy to, to hear this dialogue because this is actually the, the message that we want to send with these lectures, yeah? that no matter what happens, you know, we, we can have airstrikes uh, here in Kiev, but we will keep uh, doing the seminars and ask each other these Nordic questions like we always do at uh, the seminars. Yeah? And thank you, uh, Professor Christakis, for staying with us and answering our questions. Uh, I will just give two closing uh, remarks. Uh, first, that we will keep doing these lectures of solidarity. Uh, on Friday, we will host uh, Sander van der Linden, he is quite famous social psychologist from Cambridge who has studied uh, misinformation and also in-group, out-group phenomena. So he will uh, continue talking on this uh, subject. And I also want to plug in our donation page. The thing is that, uh, you know, Ukraine needs uh, your solidarity, but also Ukraine needs your support in terms of military support, but also humanitarian support. And our own university, Kiev School of Economics, we launched um, uh, the donation page, it is here in the chat. Um, our donation is, our fund is registered in the US, which means that it's transparent, it's legal. You can send money in the American dollars, Euro, crypto, and uh, American citizens and organizations uh, uh, can accept, well, they can expect all, all the tax deductions according to American law. So. Um, please uh, support us through donations as well. And again, uh, Nicholas, thank you so much. This has been uh, an amazing experience for me. You know, I wish uh, I wish I could invite you under other circumstances just to my class and present, you know, your books and papers and talk about networks. And it's such a pleasure for me. Next you know, year, that you agreed. Next year, exactly. Next year. In the, in a peaceful Kiev, we will invite you to to give a seminar. To present your book, which will be translated to Ukrainian language, of course. Uh, so thank you very much. We are we are very honored and uh, and happy to have you. Thank, thank you. you. Good luck. Thank you. Um, bye bye. <laughs>